You know, we are guaranteed that the very moment we trust the Lord Jesus as our Savior. But surprising as it may seem, you and I can choose. Now get this. You and I can choose in a real sense how we're going to make that entrance into his presence. If we're going to make that entrance, that will be a tremendous profitable thing for us, if I could put it that way. Or whether, so to speak, we're going to be saved by the skin of our teeth. <laughs> now, we're all going to be in his wonderful presence. If we trust in the Lord Jesus. But, folks, there's a difference. There's a difference how we're going to enter in. And um, uh, the same as there's a difference for the unsaved. Because they are going to all be in the lake of fire, to be sure. But there's degrees of torture there. But for the saint of God, there is also degrees of blessing for the child. And uh, I fear, especially in this day and age, that as far as the entrance into the presence of the Lord is concerned, It'll just be an entrance period. And by God's grace, I don't want that to be true. And I don't want that to be true for those that I minister to. I don't want it to be true for my life, and I don't want it to be true for you. And I'd like to share with you some of the things that the Bible has to say, whereby your entrance and my entrance might be that for which the Lord purposed. So would you take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. And I'm going to read the first 11 verses. And we're going to spend most of our time in the morning sessions just in this passage. And probably relate to other passages also, but this is going to be our major consideration. So I want to read 2 Peter chapter 1 down through verse 11. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly, into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now I would like to take as sort of our theme, the thought of the abundant entrance. And in this passage, it lends itself to a very simple but very important progression of thought. After the introduction in verses 1 and 2, from verse 3 <coughs> through 4, three and four, you have uh, the amazing provision of God for us. Three and four, the provision of the Lord. And then five, six, and seven, the practice of the saint. And then verses eight through 11, the prospect of that saint, or the prophet, or loss, whatever it may be. Now, you will see that in the last part of verse 11, that he's speaking, or verse 11 itself, is speaking of the entrance into this 
uh, everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, I do not believe that this relates to that entrance into the kingdom of the Lord, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the moment one is saved. I believe this is looking forward, using the same term, but looking forward to that end time of the life of the believer into the wonderful presence, eternal presence of the Lord. Because the context, I believe, supports this. Speaks of the provision of God, then speaks of the practice of the saint, and then the prospect, in light of his provision, and on the basis of the practice of the believer. So, this morning, although every one of us here this morning, I'm sure, agree to the fact that we are saved by faith, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works. Every one of us here this morning are firmly convinced that we're saved by the grace of God alone. That works has absolutely nothing to do with our salvation. But once we are saved, then works has a lot to do with it. As to the manner of our saved life, and as to the prospect of what that saved life has for us. And I fear that we, uh, as those who be termed uh, security of the believers and all of this, uh, we have um, become so afraid of the Arminian doctrine of mentioning works that we have robbed ourselves of what the Bible has to say concerning the type of life that we are to have after we trust in Christ. And so, I trust this will be as much a blessing to you as it has been to me in uh, the study of this portion within view, the prospect of the believer. Now, this morning, let us look at the provision of our wonderful Father in light of verse 3 and 4. And I think what we'll do is <clears throat> we will sort of make a little bit of an outline and... Uh, trust this will be a, a benefit for us. So as we look at the provision in verses 3 and 4, I'd like to sort of at this point outline from the grammar the progression of verse 3 and 4. Now then you will see that it states, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, first of all, the provision or the plan of God by provision is solely by grace. Isn't that right? According to his divine part, he has given. So we start out the very same way, if you please, whereby you and I are saved solely by the grace of God. Now then, he speaks of grace concerning something else. In light of provision now, he stated, according as the, his divine part has given unto us what? What has his divine power given unto us? By his grace... His arm of omnipotence. And we're dealing with an almighty sovereign God as to what He by grace provides for us. Now I'm told He gives us what? All things. Everything that pertains unto what? To things. Unto life. Now this could be viewed not only for the beginning of life, but also for that life's reality. Life and the manner of that life will be godliness. So by grace, by grace, the full abundance has been provided for that life and that life to be lived in a way that's going to bring glory to our God and blessing for us. I'm sure many of you 
I become very heartsick. With reference to contemporary uh, thought in many areas, that uh, because one is saved and he's not under law, but under grace, then he is free to go ahead and live just as he so desires. Now the Bible knows nothing, absolutely nothing, of that kind of approach. I am free, absolutely I am free. I am free from the bondage of sin. I am free from the guilt of sin. I am free in the family of God, but I am free to live that life according to a particular standard before God. And that is, I am free to live that life in a godly manner. Therefore, the idea that I am free to go back into a life that I've been delivered from, that's foreign, absolutely foreign to the provision of God's grace. Absolutely so. And I trust that you will forever, absolutely forever, have that indelibly imprinted in your heart and in your mind. You know, you, even though we may just be a few, that's fine. We'll just hold the scriptural teaching that a few constitutes the majority of God. So, now look at it here, according to his grace. Now then, uh, <coughs> he gives us what we call three clauses that follow. And these three clauses that follow have a particular construction it showing means. Now, look at it. <clears throat> Through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Now, having made this provision, this provision is, first of all, by the means of what? And by the means of the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. All right. That provision... God chose to make to you and make for me through the means of not my reason, not my emotions, not my desires, not by the standards of the world, but by the means of the Word of God. Through the knowledge of Him, that has called us to glory and virtue. Where are you going to gain that knowledge? Where are you? There's only one textbook, isn't that right? There's only one source. Absolutely so. It is the word of the Lord. Actually, verse 3 is the key to 2 Peter. It really is. Because 2 Peter is a book in light of these last days and in light of looking forward to the day of the Lord and the great day of God, is that what manner of men ought we to be in all godliness and right conduct? Isn't that right? So 2 Peter is a book that is very, very, very interested in the life of the believer in light of the plan and the program of God. And that life of the believer is to be a life of godliness. Now then, having stated that, he's going to show us that he's made a provision whereby this life and God of godliness has a wonderful, <laughs> inspired, inerrant road map. It's by the knowledge of the one who has called us to glory and virtue, or the one who's revealed in the word of the Lord. And you see, as we come to know of Him, we come to learn of Him in light of what He's called us to. He's called us to this life that He has given to us so that this life all things of life and godliness might be a life of glory and of virtue. Now, <laughs> this is God's doing. 
Not mine. Sometimes we have to set back and take a hard line of thought. And we have to discipline ourselves. That's all there is to it. And someone said, oh, don't do that. No, no, you mustn't do that. Wait a minute. I must discipline myself in order that I might appropriate the grace of God. Because if I don't appropriate the grace of God for a life of godliness, you know what I'm going to appropriate? I'm going to appropriate his chastisement. He can spank me. And <laughs> I've had enough spankings in life that I, that I don't relish that. <laughs> I had a mother and father that, that believed in discipline and the uh, <laughs> applying the Board of Education to the seat of learning. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm grateful for that now. My mother insists that I never got enough of it. She might be right. But uh, discipline, discipline is necessary. And discipline is necessary in the Christian life. And that's also the reason we have a few disciplinary standards. Not very many. We're very lax up there in some ways. But uh, we have certain standards. Certain standards that I feel are necessary for a testimony of life of godliness. Because we've been called by this wonderful person into this life, which is a life of glory and a life now then, in verse 4, you start out with a, another one of these dia clauses, by whom, or whereby, are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world to lust. Now, let me just <coughs> state this. Now, by means of the word <coughs> to, by means whereby, are given now. Grace, 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 all the way through. Isn't that right? Given, given, given. Given, given, given. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Well, this word acts as a means or a standard for my life. And this word also unveils for me tremendous and glorious promises. And please observe the, uh, the, uh, how, how they're described. They're great. Which gives to us that wonderful sense of value. Isn't that right? The prestige, the honor, the dignity, and precious. emphasize how endearing they can be to the body of the So here we have mentioned right here, as far as the provision of God at this point, is that by His grace, He has given to me in all things that which pertains to a life, to a life that's manifested, godliness. And the means that he has chosen, actually, for my standard, is the word of the Lord. <coughs> now, if this is true, as it is, most emphatic, then please tell me, logically, what happens for the dear saint of God. That's not in the book. What's wrong? Well, do you know what's wrong? We are in a desert with reference to knowing the word of God. Our whole standard of living, the speed of life, our society, 
but to make things worse, the type of training that is being given in many of our Bible schools. Seminaries. To say nothing of fact, that the vast majority of the churches today are far more engaged in activity than in religion. We're robbing people. We're absolutely robbing folks of the provision of God. Now, how can we possibly have a clear conscience of that? May I just once again, so if you have any questions as to the type of, of individual I, I may be, which is very irrelevant, but at least many people like to know, and uh, after they find out, well, we're glad we knew. That settles the issue with us, with you. So I'm not going to keep you guessing at all. I'm engaged in Bible college training. We have a Bible college that absolutely refuses. And as long as I have a breath of life to my being, it's going to be that way. A Bible college that refuses to be engaged in the teaching of the secular of the academics. Our school is absolutely, completely, and totally theological. And uh, there are a number of reasons for it. Because we try to teach one course of theology and Bible and then bring into the academics over here why you can't do justice to either field and short change your students. When they graduate, why they're not able to handle the book and not, are not uh, competent and equipped in the area of the academics to face life. So we short change students. Out there. But most of all, I believe that Bible college training is not just the imparting of facts, the imparting of certain biblical truths. But connected with Bible college training, I believe there must be a challenge of the impartation of the life that God provides to the Lord. Just right here. And that is the persuasion of your spirit of That is how God has called me to this life. And I find a happy confirmation of that call. With reference the passage of this. He's given me, and he's given you, by his omnipotence, life, and all things forgotten. He's given it to you by means of his word, of the one who's called you. He's given you not only the word, but the precious promises of this word, that have now a tremendous purpose. Now look at it. That by these, that by these, you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through life. Will you watch your Bibles and let me read for you just a little, uh, this passage just a little differently to emphasize the type of verb that we have. In order that by these you might become, you might become partakers or you might become sharers of a divine Having escaped the corruption that is in the world by or through lust or lawlessness. Now, the very purpose of God in giving me life and godliness through his word is that I might have fellowship in something that I've never, 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 never known before. And I'm going to put this word here so that you'll know. Ginomai. That Greek word, ginomai, can
can be translated this word as the verb to be because it's very, very similar in emphasis to the verb to be in. But ginomai looks at something that comes into existence that, of that which never existed before. For instance, in John chapter 3, you remember, remember the discussion that Nicodemus had with the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, the Lord stated, except a man be born on a and from above, he cannot either see nor enter into the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not unto you that I say that you must be born from above, etc. The wind blows it where it wants to, and you cannot hear the sound there, or tell where it comes or goes, so is everyone that is born of the spirit. And Nicodemus, Nicodemus, in his question, literally stated, how can this, these things come into being? How can it come into being? And of course the Lord tells us how that comes into being, the new birth is by trusting Christ. In John 3, 16, it's just that simple. And so the emphasis here, that all of this is given for the wonderful purpose of God in this life, that I might become and you might become one that can have fellowship. Our divine nature. Now this changes the picture just a little, doesn't it? But it is in keeping with the purpose of first Peter, uh, second Peter. Because he gives us everything that pertains to life and godliness. Coming about by the word of the Lord. In order that I might receive at the very moment I trust the Lord Jesus something. But that is not the emphasis here. The emphasis is the activity of what I become in order that I might become one to partake, and this word partake, and that's poor. That's absolutely a poor translation here in 2 Peter uh, 1, 4. The Greek word is koinonia. And it is translated, for instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, uh, communion. It's also translated in uh, 1 John. That, you, uh, that which we have seen and heard, we declare unto you that you also may have what? Fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. That's exactly the same word as fellowship. Fellowship. And it means to fellowship together on a common basis. That which is true for one another. And the Lord's desire for you and for me in this life that we might become those that have a fellowship of a divine nature. My, isn't that tremendous? The purpose of God for you and for me is a life of fellowship. And he gives us a negative here. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. He doesn't want us there. Absolutely not. I've been liberated from not only that mode and method of life, but he wants me totally liberated in conduct from the activity of that life. He, he says, now listen, I've made a provision for a purpose. And the purpose of God relates to your activity and my activity. And he's going to come on down the line a little bit later and say, so that you can have what? An abundant, an abundant entrance. And folks, if we do not preach, teach, live that, we are going to be introducing precious ones Christ died, for whom Christ died, into an entrance they're going to be spiritually polished. Now, 
you will recall uh, some years ago when I taught the, the, a morning session for you, I taught from Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Would you turn back there with me to show, just to bear this in mind. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 states this. <clears throat> the very purpose of God in salvation. <clears throat> for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine that we might be conformed to the image of his Son. Now, you see, the purpose of God in saving you and saving me is that we might have a perfect pattern. And that is his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that he saved you and he saved me to be conformed unto the very image of his son. Now that's the purpose of God, and you know, we spent some little time of some of the secrets, how he uh, conforms us to the image of his son. But Second Peter chapter 1 is showing us from the practical point of view how that once we have become saved, those who obtain like precious faith with us, that's that thing, showing us the activity of life in godliness is a life that we are to have fellowship in life of a divine nature. It, it, it's just wonderful. And the, if we were to, if we were to try to <laughs> bore you, but maybe elaborate just a little. This word, the subject of it, in order that you might become those who fellowship. You almost have to translate it that way. That's what we call a predicate nominative. And that predicate nominative simply is a further description of the subject you. You are to be those fellowship. So he is narrowing down what you are to become and what you are to be to fully manifest that life of godliness that you and I might be those who be fellowshipping with a divine nature because we have been liberated I can just put it that way liberated from the corruption. And that word corruption is a terrible word. It relates in a terrific contrast how wonderful the fellowship is to be of that which it's not to be. The corruption is that word that looks at something decayed. Something that is totally, totally correct. I uh, used to wax rather eloquent on some of these things I thought I did and give some hideous, hideous illustrations. And I, uh, I don't want to do that, but I do want to drive the point home by an illustration. And that is this. In Romans chapter 3, You'll recall the catalog of the depravity of man where it states, and their throat is as an open sepulcher. Well, why is a sepulcher? A sepulcher is a place of an open box where there's a dead body exposed. Isn't that right? Now, what happens? What happens to a body after death? Decomposition sets in. Isn't that right? And as a boy in the mountains of Colorado, we used to have <coughs> what we called free range. We'd, we'd purchase a, uh, a range permit, to, and then a particular time of the year, in the spring, where we'd turn our cattle out on the range. And that's where they get pasture until around October, when we'd have roundup time and ship the young stock to market after they'd been fattened on, on the grazing. <coughs> well. You have to watch out for certain things. Everything has its perils. And uh, in a certain time of the year, larkspur 
uh, would grow very, very prolifically in certain areas of those, of those range areas. And uh, uh, it would just simply kill your cattle. And uh, my father always told me, but now when you're out to, and you run across something like this, why well, please report it to me so that uh, I'll know, at least I want to know, if we've lost any cattle. And <clears throat> I'll tell you, I have often investigated such things, and you know what you see. It's a, I, I've ridden up on my horse, and, and uh, of course you, you know it's dead by virtue of the odor. And uh, as I'd uh, ride to this place, why even the horse, as I was riding, the horse, here, here's a dumb beast, uh, would refuse. I get, I get so close, and then when this horse heard all and saw all of the cloud of the buzzing of the flies and uh, and uh, uh, the stench and all, <laughs> shyly wouldn't go, absolutely wouldn't go to that dead beast that was in the, the throes of decomposition and with all of the corruption that was involved. God states this. God states this. In light of an abundant entrance, I have made a provision now. Now. So that you might fellowship in a divine nature sphere. Not in the decayed decomposition and corruption that exists what lust. Epithumia. And you know what that is? That is a longing desire. The word tells us with reference to the heroes of faith that if they had been mindful of the place from which they came, they might have returned. But they didn't have a mind to go back. Oh, the child of God begins to be nurtured and discovers the sweetness of the fellowship of a divine nature. He will not be engaged in the long desire. provision made, made for a fall, a first job, granted. But all oh, the fellowship of life. <laughs> so I think we'll stop at that point because it comes to a, another division. But here is the provision of the Lord. And it's a wonderful provision. It's a provision that I might become I might become one in fellowship, but in a line of each other, not in corruption. What a blessed person. Father, I thank you and praise you for the abundance of your grace, the marvel of your lovely word, and then to see that this life is godliness life of God is simply the life to be lived and a life of fellowship of that of the nature. Minister these precious truths to our hearts and our lives in such a way when it comes time for that beck and call from heaven that we can anticipate. fruitful, rich, and